Hi, I'm Laura Hum. I'm one of the Dialogue Doctor editors, and I'm here today with Barbara Clark to work on an opening scene. That's pretty exciting. Barbara, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your work? Well, um, I'm a retired patent attorney, had chemical engineering background, and um, so worked on a lot of um, eco-friendly technologies and also, also on technologies with rare earth minerals, which are the subject of my book. Um, and then I had an ex the experience of going to Antarctica, is the Antarctic Peninsula, um, <clears throat> on, a, on a cruise of sorts. It's a small small group, and we we got to camp one night. We dug our graves, essentially they called it, and we oh. slept in bivy bags. Um, and as the ship left, it was a Russian captain. I had this thought, like, what if he doesn't come back for us? what would we do? Oh. You're told not to take any food or anything. And there's no trees. There's no, you know, there's just seals and, and well, you know, uh, nice. Hello. Yeah. So that was the impetus for my story is that that moment in 2016, actually. Of so, when you were left on a big iceberg with a few other not an iceberg it was the land it was the peninsula you know but i mean it is it we only saw like the tip of the antarctic peninsula and the amount of snow and ice there is just boggles the imagination it's just it's unreal and that was just a little bit of antarctica so i've just always been drawn to antarctica and to the climate and uh you know i have a technical background so this book um i set it in a little bit in the future in 2050 at a time when um, rare earth minerals are no longer available. So that it's re in all our technology. So that's, we're back in the 1980s. If you've been around, you know what that's like. I remember. The Thwaites Glacier, which is one in the news, um, has already collapsed and there's been a two foot sea level rise. So we're left in a world that, you know, no electronics and, you know, we still have the climate problem. Uh, enter Carlos, my villain who um, has found with others a magnetic crystal that has properties that exceed the rare earths. And he could bring back all the technologies, um, mm. but that will make, like the, if the Thwaites, Thwaites Glacier was the first domino, it will make all the other dominoes fall and in the world as we know it in terms of where people can live and such. So my, my protagonist is a uh, feisty, um, a young, meteorologist wit widow and uh she has a geology background and she ends up she's very curious she ends up meeting carlos finding a crystal and she has a skill of climbing um ice climbing and such so she sets off on a course instead of just kind of relaxing and she sets off like i got to figure this out when she realizes what his plan is that he's gonna harvest some stash of them and crown the next global superpower she's like determined she has to stop him Mm -hmm. and, uh, so she risks everything to keep him from getting those crystals known out in the broader world. Okay. So to kind of summarize that, you've got the world as we know it has changed significantly. All of our technology is gone. Right. We have one man who has found a way to return us to that technology, but changes the way that we live because it creates a, 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 a catastrophe as far as earth goes. Yes. And then you've got the protagonist who wants to see the world safe and needs to protect Antarctica specifically from this village. Right. And our, but the, so much melting or collapsing will happen. It's, it will affect the rest of the world. And she's just fine in this 1980s world. In fact, you know, it's kind of, a, she's a sustainable act, you know, because the mining of rare earths is not a sustainable thing in our world. And we could run out. I mean, that's a legitimate um, concern. Okay. So not far out there. Okay. So the goal for working with me today is what? I would like you to take a look at my, or I guess you have taken a look at my uh -huh. chapter and I, I have had probably about 10 different openings. Um, I've started with the protagonist. I've started with a flash forward, a flashback of, I, so this I think is, a, I hope is a good opening, but I have been querying, actually it's three years um, and I started querying way too soon. 
um, should not have been out there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, actively for the last, you know, year and or so. I've had some really good luck with some contests and things. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. But, and a request for a full a year ago from a um, e-publisher, digital first publisher, and with lots of wonderful feedback. And so I'm, and one of the issues, um, and from that person, that group and somebody else was that my, my villain seemed a little cartoonish, almost, a, you know, of, of what an evil person should be. So I am trying in the opening now to give him a little more texture. Okay. And uh, so. Excellent. All right. So um, opening chapters. Let Before we get into the document that you sent me, let's talk opening chapters just for a moment. So your opening chapter is something that you want your readers to fall in love with your story. You want them to connect to a character. You want them to understand the world that the character lives in. And you want them to be invested so that they're going to continue along with their story, with your story, um, because then it's going to be their story too, right? right. So it's um, when I was reading this, I had, because uh, this story, like you said, is about Carlos. Carlos is your not this story, excuse me, this chapter, this chapter is about Carlos. Um, I wasn't sure when I read it, if Carlos was supposed to be the villain that you love or the villain that you hate. So you, do you have some thoughts on what you want from your reader? I do. Uh, what's he, he is a scientist in his background and such, um, but he's been through a lot of things that have, um, it, it made him bitter and, mm -hmm. um, He's always been a little megalomaniac as well. I mean, he, as, as things happen, he, so when he, he also is, was worried about the climate at, at, at one point, but now he thinks he's the return to the technologies is, is more important. Um, and he doesn't care what the outcome is. He will have some glory and be recognized, you know, for, for having saved the world in terms, you know, in terms of technologies. Okay. Um, so well, you, you could well, go, go ahead. ahead. Keep going. You could, um, I think you'll hate him. <laughs> okay. Eventually. And that's what you want from your readers. You want your readers to hate him. Yeah. But, it, but I, I had pro I had tried to add something to give a little understanding as to how he turned, you know, in, mm -hmm. in things that happened with, with some family members and just his basic personality. Um, okay. and he's particularly angry at the U S uh, he's you know, later on find out he's had some experiences here and his his things happen to his wife that is because of the U.S. and so there's no MRI machines as well that was the big thing so she mm. had breast cancer and so he blames everyone else for his problems and Got he's it. gonna fix it. Okay, so I guess the question is from him: Do we want your readers to dislike him? Or do we want your readers to feel for him and dislike his actions? I don't, <laughs> we would have to dislike his actions because you know how this ends. Sure. Um, there's, a big, there's a big surprise at the end. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I just want, he has some humanity in him. There's good and bad and bad and good in everybody. So he's, I just made sure he wasn't a one dimensional and it's up to the reader how they, they feel Got about it. what he's doing. He has some humanity in him still. Okay. So that is the key that I wanted to get across here, because if this is your opening chapter, traditionally your opening chapter is either like a prequel that, you know, just kind of orients you to the world or gets you excited, or it's a chapter that you connect with one of the characters because you want to go on their journey with them. You've created kind of the former in there's this like big thing happening, shaking up that you want to learn more about to get into the story, but you don't necessarily need to connect with your character. It puts you in a really tough spot as a writer because if you're going to write that way you have to have that first chapter be 100% compelling 
you have to have the characters and it feel 100% real so that your readers are willing to get through the fact that you're introducing the villain before you introduce the protagonist. <laughs> right. And I had had it that way, introduce mm -hmm. the protagonist. And actually the one who requested the full wanted that changed up. She says, it's a thriller. Start with a thrill. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I second chapter puts them both on the same ship. Okay. Uh, and so it, it, and she overhears things, she knows Spanish and she can overhear some, some things. And so, but that wasn't much of a thrill, but I, I needed to, I want to describe this, this voyage and introduce her with her best friend, who's kind of a comic relief person. Um, but it just wasn't the thrill they were looking for. Okay. At one point I went five years earlier and described her mom's death. And it's like, well, that's just, really yeah. Yeah, that's not going to work. I had a flash forward with the bomb in the boat, you know, on a lifeboat. It's like, no, nah, that's not going to work. That's yeah. <laughs> so the, I've had the most success with with this. So, but I mm -hmm. I'm open to suggestions for yeah. changing. So I like this as your first chapter. I like okay. it because it gives you a great way of orienting your readers to the world, okay. right? You've, you, the world has changed. It's not what we know it. You've put it in the future, but not the too distant future. So like it's, it's understandable. It's knowable. You've given us some context there. The places that I would work on with you and will work on with you as it relates to a first chapter are two things. Okay. One, strengthening Carlos. Right now you have him as a villain, which he's your villain. So you want to have him villainy, but you're also describing him as this scientist who had the best intentions when he started, who is kind of lost his way in a revenge plot. I would not say he had the okay. best intentions when he started because oh. he, he had, he had lost, fan, he's lost his wife. He'd lost everything. And he was, he, he was in a funk and was ordered to get back to work or, or, you know, lose the job. So he goes to a conference where he meets the geologist, a very naive fella. He plies him with my, and he happens to pull out some crystal that he was excited about. He's just researching it. He didn't. So crystal just, or crystal Carlos um, sees that as an opportunity to kind of get back on top again. Okay. Um, so. So would you say in the early part of his career, before he lost his wife, like he was doing research for the good of the world, the good of society, or was he always kind I of- I would say, that, no, I would say he used ice cores, you know, drilling for ice cores and such, but he was, he was always a jerk. Okay. So he's, he's always been a villain. He just used life circumstances to kind of- Justify. Embrace his, okay. All right. Um, so that's important because I was actually going to push his voice in a different direction, um, but that that's good to know. Um, so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to work on Carlos's voice a little bit to make sure that he's consistent all the way through the scene and okay. that we love to hate him. The other thing that we're going to work on is simplifying things for the reader. This is something that is very, very common for writers because as writers, we know the story. We have everything in our head and it just, that's just what's happening, right? As a reader though, sometimes there are elements in the story that we don't have all the information for and it makes it a little bit hard for us as the reader to stay in line with where the author is. And in the Dialogue Doctor community, we call that reader burden. Reader what? reader burden. The okay. writer is creating a reader burden, meaning that we want the reader to figure something out or we're leaving something unsaid for the reader to figure out. Now, sometimes reader burden is a really great thing, right? You're writing a thriller. You want your readers to be figuring stuff out. But the thing about it is you want your reader to be figuring stuff out that you want them to be figuring out the who done it, the why is he the way he is? What could this rare crystal actually do? How could that change? Right? Like you want them thinking about your story. You don't want them wondering, well, who is this guy? Where? Why is he in the scene? What's happening here? You're saying that he's really angry, but he, his 
behavior isn't matching. Like you want them to just stay really streamlined. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and I okay. will kind of orient you to the notes that I've made and then we'll work through them one set at a time. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. While I'm sharing, do you have any questions for me? Uh, no, not, not just, okay. just yet. I did remove a, a lot of scientific stuff. I've had to back off on, on a lot of that. So I'll be interested in what you, uh, yeah. What you so I'm really glad you brought up the sciencey stuff because, um, science, we, a lot of people think about science as that class we sat in as a kid that's like super boring. And then we just have this teacher who's just like, womp, 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 right? But then you have the other side of science, which actually is super cool, right? Like without science, we wouldn't have smartphones. Without science, we wouldn't have MRIs. Without science, we wouldn't have, right? Like there's so many things that science gives us. So the trick to writing science in fiction and not just in science fiction, but science in fiction in general, is to make it super interesting. So you can do that by making what the people are saying about science really interesting and really impactful. Um, and I think that you did a really good job with that in a lot of places in here. Um, and we can point that out kind of as we go. But okay. the notes that I have here um, are based off of Carlos's voice. And then, um, so that's what you see um, in the like teal color with the white font. And all I did as I, so when I edit, I always do a read first just to kind of get a feel for what's happening. Cause you know, honestly, every editor should just be a reader as well and just kind of get a feel for the story. Okay. And then as I went back to kind of look at the questions that you had about how do you make this chapter really compelling for your readers to ensure they get into the heart of the story, to ensure that they want to meet your protagonist, um, we wanted to make sure that we had Carlos be um, very compelling, even if we don't like him. So I went through and I just grabbed everything that he said and did and felt, and I created it in a single color. That way we can look at it all at once without having to worry about the voices of the people he's talking to. Okay. So that's one thing I did. Um, and then another thing that I did is I went through and just as I was reading things and things um, didn't necessarily make sense to me, or I just had a question about, I just put those in um, comments in the margins. We might not go through all of those today. You'll get them um, when I send this back to you. Some of them we'll get to, some of them we won't. But the thing that I wanted to look at most is your chapter is broken into two halves. The first half, you have Carlos and Omar. Omar, I'm assuming, is the scientist who actually found the crystals. The geologist. His, his professor, um, yeah, left them in a drawer. And, and so, th yes, he is the one that introduced the crystals to Carlos. Got it. And then yeah. you have Jeff, who's kind of like, maybe they're lackey? Yep. Okay, <laughs> great. So you have the three of them in a room together. Um one of the things that I had trouble with was where they're located in the scene. So you'll notice that I have a couple of places where there are phrases that are bolded and underlined. And I apologize, it's a little harder to see in the green with the white font, um, but you can see it a little bit better in um, the just regular black font. Those are places where you had action for the characters. Now in Dialogue Doctor, we talk a lot about body language and as a part of communication. And body language are the movements that we use to communicate with other people. So I, for example, use my hands a lot when I'm talking. So if somebody were writing me, um, in addition to my weird and crazy pauses that they would put in my cadence, my body language would be like, I'm gesturing with my hands, I'm pointing over here, I'm like using my head and my fingers to like highlight this over here. But that's my body language. It's an expression of what I'm saying and what I'm feeling. Actions are movements 
within the scene that allow us to choreograph the scene. They don't have anything to do with expression. They can, and it, this is where it can get really like muddy between. So like if you have a waiter who is carrying a tray across the room, the action of carrying the tray would be an action because it's like movement to choreograph the scene. But if he tips the tray to somebody expecting a tip, then that could be like body language. So it it gets really murky what's actually action and what's actually body language. It doesn't really matter what you call it as long as you're paying attention to both parts of it. So one of the things that I had a problem with and I felt like I kept going back to are like, orienting where these people are in the room okay so initially carlos is kneeling on the dining room floor and omar is hovering nearby so you can see and notice that as i'm talking about this i'm only focusing on the pieces that i've highlighted this can be a really great tip as you're editing if you find that there's something that you really want to work on Chapters have a lot of words, right? Like that's what we want from others is we want a lot of words, but we have to find a way to just focus in on the one thing we're looking at. And in this case, we're looking at placement in the room, but because we were also looking at Carlos, we had two different, sometimes I would say just color code the elements that are about placement. And, but I was using color coding for um, voice in this case. So you kind of can't do it in both. So circle, highlight, in this case, I bolded and underlined, whatever it is, find a way to just focus on the elements of where people are. So Carlos is kneeling on the dining room floor and Omar is hovering nearby. They have a couple of exchanges, but then Omar slides the floor, floorboards into place. In my mind, in this picture, I have a dining room one man is kneeling on the floor. Omar, because he's saying, hurry, um, they'll be here any minute. I'm assuming he's by a doorway, whether that's where you wanted him to be doesn't actually matter because that's the picture I have in my head. But then the next time I see him, he's sliding floorboards into place. So I'm wondering now, how did he get from wherever he was hovering nearby to now kneeling to slide the floorboards into place. So I should say with his foot, <clears throat> maybe, or he kneeled, I, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, so they were being stored under the floorboards. The, the crystals were in bins under the floorboards, but I never yep. said that, did I? No, I no, I got that. That was um, carefully, he, Carlos muttered as he carefully stowed the yep. crystals into their bin, got all of that. So one thing, and the reason that I did it this way is because again, you know your story. If you were doing this without me and somebody said to you, um, you know, Barbara, I really liked your story, but I had a really hard time figuring out where your characters were in your story. Um, this would be a way that you could help reduce that reader burden. So by just highlighting where everybody is, allows you to track them and their actions in a way that you don't have to look at anything else. You can just kind of figure out where they are. And okay. then you look- No, like I said, okay. Now I'm just wondering why, where you got the part that you thought um, they were by a door. I don't know. It just It's just how I pictured it. When, when he's hovering nearby and he says, hurry, Carlos, they'll be here any minute. To me, if you're worried about people coming in, you're like watching the door for them. I don't know. It's just how the scene okay. unfolded in my head. Okay. You didn't tell me anything. So I had to fill in the blanks myself in the picture. If that's not what's happening, if that's not what you want your readers to think, or it's something really, if so if you don't care the picture that your readers have about the scene, that's fine. I but did you, a little, because I, I talked about the windows, um, Yep. That they're, they're, maybe he's looking out the windows. Mm -hmm. kind yep. of what I yeah. And so this is, this is a great thing to bring up here because Barbara, you're clearly thinking about this room, right? And what I really love about what you did is you didn't spend a ton of time painting the picture of the room that they're in because you don't need to, right? 
They're in a dining room. There's a big open window. Love that, right? You got right into the fact that they've been here for six months and they're on this base, right? I love that. I think that's great. What I just want you to do is just take just one extra step. So what what I would suggest is here, um, Omar hovered nearby, Hur hurry Carlos, they'll be here any minute. Please, we need to put the floorboards back. Let me just turn on my um, reviewer mode here and add a new, uh, nope. No, don't do that. Sorry, I don't know how to use this. You'd think I use this every single day that eventually I would figure out how to use this program. Maybe you just add that Omar stepped closer to Carlos, right? He's Some already people, hovering nearby, so that... Yeah, and, and this is where you, Barbara, are going to figure out what okay. you want to do. Okay. So ordinarily, what I would suggest if a, an author is struggling or your readers are struggling is... I have an exercise that I encourage people to do if they like 3D figures. So I would take a piece of paper, like just a sheet of either um, plain printing paper, or maybe you have a piece of um, mail that you don't want anymore before it goes in the recycle bin and set it on your table and then grab a element. Um, some people like to, my, my spouse loves mini figurines from Lego. So, uh, sorry, he tells me I cannot call them figurines because figurines are dolls, mini figures from Lego. Yeah. So what I would do is I would go to his cabinet and I would get, because I know there are three characters in the scene, I would grab three of his Lego figures, one for each of them. And as soon as there is a place in the story, I would draw that on the page. So they're in the dining room. There's a window. I would draw the window. Oh, and interesting. He, kneeling on the floor. So I would make the Lego figure kneel or sit down or lay down, like whatever I would do to make yeah. it so I know that he's kneeling. And then when I say Omar is hovering nearby, I have Omar's little Lego and I'm like, what's nearby to me versus what's nearby to you? Is nearby like standing over his shoulder? Is nearby hovering at the door? That oh, I should say standing over his shoulder. Right. Yeah. So, and that's, and that's the thing is like, how nearby is nearby? Got Did it. Omar, because to me, nearby is like in the room. Clearly yeah. to you nearby was like standing behind him. Right. So right. That, that makes a big difference. <laughs> It, it, it does. I um, originally, the first sentence had Car uh, uh, Omar's location as, and it was, but it got too long. It said, as Omar looked on, it ended with it. And that yeah. would have been, you wouldn't have been confused. I, I mean, even or looked not confused. On. You wouldn't have drawn that picture. You weren't confused. I just didn't. Well, yeah. and, and that's the thing is sometimes you don't care what your readers think. You just want your readers paying attention to the story. But because these people have very specific actions, Omar sliding the floorboards into place, he has to be close enough. And what's Carlos doing when Omar, so like if I'm stand, if I'm kneeling on the floor and somebody like, I'm assuming, and again, this is the picture that I've painted in my head. A cubby under the floor is either a couple of floorboards are moved. So we're talking about a box that's maybe a shoebox size, or we're talking about big bins and we've opened up the floor like we're walking down to a cellar. You know, there are lots of ways you can hide stuff under the floor. What are we hiding here? Now, this is one of those things as an author, you can be like, does it really matter, Laura? In the grander scheme of things, no, it doesn't matter. But if I, as your reader, am focusing on, wait, I thought Omar was by the door. How is he sliding the floorboards into place? I'm not focusing on the fact that these crystals can save the world. Right. Like, right. You want me to focus on the fact that the crystals can save the world. But here I am. We've talked, what, for 10, 15 minutes about how far is nearby to Omar? Is he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, where's the doorway? How, why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that and that's the thing about reader burden 
is as an author, you have no idea of knowing where your reader's burden is going to be. This is where you can rely on your beta readers or your friends or your editor or somebody that you trust that's going to tell you, hey, I really like your story. I really like these points. I was confused by this. Can you help me out a little bit? So because this was something that I struggled with, not just with Omar and Carlos as it relates to the bin, but as we keep going, you've got this lanky young man lounging against the wall. I'm at the bottom of the page here, and all of a sudden there's a third person in the scene that I didn't know about. Oh, now I'm surprised, right? So an easy way to focus on this is Carlos uttered a prayer of gratitude under his breath so that Omar and Jeff didn't hear him, right? Like just orient me to who's ah, in the room, okay. right? Like you can, you can do it simply as that. Or Omar hovered nearby, glancing nervously at Jeff who's lounging, right? Like you can bring the characters in just a little bit earlier so nobody's surprised that, oh, there's this, because the minute you say that there's this lanky young man lounging against the wall, I'm assuming that this guy's like a creeper or, right? Because now <laughs> I'm not focusing on Carlos and Omar who are like snipping at each other. I want to know who this guy is now that, that he has all of my attention, right? So then just as I keep going back and forth, now I don't really know where Omar is because the last place I saw Omar oops no, sorry not Omar I don't know where Carlos is because the last place I saw Carlos was kneeling by the dining room floor you never tell me he stands up he never walks around he's so as far as I know this guy's still kneeling on the dining room floor oh my gosh yeah and, and again <laughs> this is this is one of those things that it's really easy for an for an author to slip because in your mind, I am sure that your dining room in your mind looks different than the dining room that I yep. have in my mind, right? In your mind, maybe um, the minute that he, um, Carlos puts the crystals in the bin, he stands up and he goes and he looks out the window and he's like way over here. And these other two guys, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Yeah. So no, I had him standing, like, you know, trying to he got up slowly and grunting and as like, I ended up cutting all that. Yeah. But that was important. Oh, that's, this is great. And see, this is the weird thing about it is because on one hand, editors are like, we don't care about that stuff. Move the story faster. Just focus on the action. We don't care about these other things. But at the same time, like if we push too far in the other direction, we don't know where anybody is. And then people are like, teleporting across the room or doing that like, <laughs> doom thing that you see where like they're over here and now they're over there and they're holding this and he's turning his back but why is he turning his back because he was already looking at me and right like is he just doing a 360 <laughs> I like the figurines idea to kind of play with those as I'm reviewing this yeah so it's just a trick that I've picked up that you don't move your pieces unless there's an action item that's showing you're moving your pieces because mm -hmm. otherwise you get this thing. And sometimes it works really great. Like here. So when I was reading, I, I got Omar stopped pacing and I had to go back and I was like, well, wait, where did Omar start pacing? And sure enough, you told me that Omar is pacing here. So like this one worked great, which is why I like to highlight it. Cause sometimes as a reader, some of these things, like I don't actually care about. Like if he's pacing and he stops pacing, that's great. Like it's a good detail because it shows he's a little bit nervous, maybe a little bit uncomfortable because that's typically what pacing, um, pacing as the physical thing, not pacing in the dialogue world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> words, you know, all the meanings because English. Um, but right, like, so that one worked really great. Um, so then there's another one over here where... So Carlos grabs the end of the table and drags it. Omar repositions. Jeff shoves a chair. And then Carlos turns back to Omar. Because um, again, there's not really, oh, Carlos spun on his heels here. And then he pointed toward the kitchen. And then Omar's sitting at the table. And then Omar stands up. And then all of a sudden, Carlos rose to meet Omar's gaze. And that one was like, wait a minute, 
I guess Carlos was sitting and then he stood up to me. So like, and then, because then at the end you have, he picked up the chair he had been sitting in and he slammed it down, which. It, it does say sitting above. He sat down across it, from him. It does. Oh, uh, okay. So see this. Carlos, thing. one more thing, Doc. Carlos sat across from him in the, um, after. Uh, help me find it because I don't going up um who was sitting at the table with his head in his hands one more thing doc Carlos oh said. see see oh that's see and this is why you do this because I totally miss this and as long as you have it if okay. I like start to get disoriented as a reader I'm just going to go back up and be like wait why is he sitting and then I'm going to see this so that is exactly what I wanted you to be able to see. I left that out on purpose as not underlined. I didn't, I really just missed it. <laughs> so, oh, okay. But yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I wanted to see is because you have that detail there and I just happened to miss it. So, but it's just one thing that I would recommend if you have a scene, especially if you have a scene where there has to be movement. And what has to have movement in the scene is that the crystals need to be put under the floorboards. Um, they have to relocate the table and you need Carlos to tell Jeff to get out so that Carlos and Omar can have a private conversation. Because there are actions that are important to the storyline, you have to help orient your reader to what's happening. So like you, like you noticed, there's more in there than I had seen. So that's great. Um, but there were still a couple of places where adding just a little bit more detail can help ease that reader burden just a little bit. Absolutely. Especially when you're talking about an opening chapter. Now, if this were a chapter that were, I don't know, you know, 15, 20, even 30 chapters in, I would not have put as much emphasis on these things as I did. I probably just would have made a note up here that, hey, can you clarify where Omar is in relation to Carlos? And I just would have let it go. But the reason that it was so important here is this is your opening chapter. And in your opening chapter, you do not want to give your reader any, 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 any reason why this book is going to be too hard for them to read. You've already got science in fiction that is going to be something that some people are really averse to. So you're going to have to make science fun and exciting, which I think you've done a really great job with. You know, the fact that there's whipping snow outside in the windows, you're creating this lovely picture for me. I think that's all really great. But if you give them like, maybe you have some people who are like, hey, you got to read Barbara Clark's book. It's really exciting. It's about science. And they're like, oh, I don't really like science books. And they're like, no, no, trust me, read it, read it. And they get into it and they're like, oh, it's a book about science. Where's the science going to be? And then they get to something that they stumble on and they're like, oh, that's my second strike, right? And, and so that's why I, in that first chapter, I try to pay really, really, really particular attention to details that maybe as an editor, I'm like, eh, okay, I get it. There, he's nearby. Maybe I misinterpreted it, right? Like, but in this first chapter, I really want everything to be kind of as smooth as possible. Does that make That's sense? really, really good advice. I'm, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> so, okay. So the next thing that I want to talk about is Carlos himself. But before I do, is there any other questions about like positionality or anything? No, that it's really helps. Okay. I, I know what I need to do, I think. Okay. So before I talk about Carlos, there is one other thing, and this is going to re relate to Carlos, but it also relates to the players. You've got three players in your scene. And we talked about like when Jeff shows up and how you can kind of orient. When you introduce a new character, you want us to know who the character is as quickly as possible. So Omar hovered nearby. And then you've got this thing about, um, you know, please put the floorboards back. He's clearly very nervous. Carlos clearly doesn't have a lot of respect for this guy. 
And it's not until we think about this section in here, he had promised Omar his research could be kept a secret from his colleagues, but he knew the geologist's worries would soon be over. So you introduce Omar here, we see him twice, we see Carlos, and then you orient us to who Omar is by saying that he his geologist worries will soon be over. But the way the sentence is phrased and the fact that it's buried under Carlos's quote makes me as the reader really have to think about this phrasing of his geologist worries. Am I the geologist or is Omar the geologist? It's just one of those really small things that if this were a scene halfway through the book and I knew your writing style and I knew when you introduced a character, I had to trust you for two or three exchanges before you tell me who they are, I'd be all in on it. But because it's the very first scene and I have to trust you as an author to tell me the story, I, as a reader, I prefer not to have to think about who my characters are right? So maybe what you do to help kind of ease this is um, maybe you say Omar, or the, maybe it's the geologist hovered nearby. Hurry, Carlos, they'll be here any minute. And then he says, Omar, check out these beauties. Oh, I love that. Right? So you're doing the same thing. Thing, you're just moving that information a little bit earlier so your reader doesn't have to think about it, right? Yep. It's yep. We just lay it out there for them in this nice, easy package because now, right? Like I don't, when I see Omar, I and now I'm picturing a geologist, right? Like I don't have to worry yeah. about like who this mystery man is. He's a geologist, right? Um, so, and then you can do, and you did the same thing here when you introduced Jeff. Um, the lanky man, uh, the lanky younger man lounged against the wall. Um, and then you did a, a, a nice job here where Carlos immediately refers to Jeff's name. So we know immediately who he is, but we still don't know why he's there. It's not for another couple of exchanges that we start to understand what Jeff's role is. So just by kind of orienting our readers just a little bit more to who the people are and who their backstory is, things get a little bit easier. Okay. So, um, and then I, I might be rem misremembering this, but I felt like at some point somebody was referred to as their last name instead of their first name. Dr. Hassan. That's a, Omar. Did I do that? Yeah. Okay. Here you go. So you've got Carlos changing from Omar to Dr. Hassan. And I yeah. didn't know who this person was. Oh, okay. So, and again, this is one of those things that we do in conversation all of the time, right? Like we know people by their first and their last name, and we often know them by their nickname. So we can use names interchangeably for people. I'm going to tell you a quick aside story here. Okay. Um, I was working on my master's thesis and I had to submit my research to um, the committee that reviews it to make sure that it's safe and I follow all the rules and everything. It's called the IRB committee. And I put in my application and my registration at the school was still under my maiden name. But I, of course, have changed my name to my married name. And I got this feedback back from the committee. And they're like, who is Miss Hum? <laughs> what is her role on the project? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm the PI. How do you not know? What I didn't, what I failed to connect is that all of the documentation, because it was through my school account, was still under my maiden name. And they hadn't made the connection, or I didn't tell them the connection that 
I'm Laura Boatler Hubs. So I'm like, they think I'm talking about a totally different person. I'm like, what do you mean? It's just, oh, that's funny. <laughs> And so I, I totally understand from an author's perspective how easy it is to be like, well, yeah, it's just the same person. But because the IRB committee didn't know me and at no place, apparently at no place in my document, did I ever say, so I actually had to write like a little note apologizing. It's, it's all the same person <laughs> and, and everything ended up working out fine and they approved it. But it's just so easy to make that slip up. Um, yeah. So I did get, because you used this up here where you have um, Carlos referring to Omar as doc. I did get that he was a doctor. We just didn't quite know his name. So you could, <clears throat> you could add his name in somewhere else, or you could take this. Um, and actually this is something about Carlos's voice that we can talk about. Is Carlos ever really going to refer to anybody by their title or is he always going to refer to them by their common name? Oh, that's, that's a good, and then the next scene, you know, there is a Dr. Miller, but he intentionally refers to him as Mr. Miller. So you're right. He's kind of degrading people. He, pr he probably right. would just say Omar. Yeah. So yeah. it's just one of those small little things that again, when it's your first chapter, it's so important that you don't give your readers any reason to focus on anything other than your story. Okay. So awesome. Okay. So I'm just going to make a quick little who note. So you have it highlighted <laughs> there. Okay. So then the last thing that we want to talk about, about your story is Carlos and Carlos's voice. Okay. We want Carlos to be a villain. And we want your readers to love to hate a villain, right? Because th that's the fun of a villain is that we can make them anything we want. Can you do me a favor before we start looking at his voice? Can you describe Carlos to me in like three to 10 words? His appearance, you mean? Or... Um, not his physical appearance, like his attitude, his um, demeanor, his personality. He's, he's thin skinned. He's proud. He doesn't, oh, you want one word? <laughs> doesn't no, take it doesn't matter. No, keep, keep going. You're doing, that's, you're doing exactly what I want to hear. Okay. He's doesn't take, if you, you have to be loyal to him. Okay. And he doesn't take, he con considers criticism disloyalty. Okay. Um, He's smart, but he's also very self-absorbed. Okay. Um, you want more? <laughs> um, just, let's go with one more if you have it. If not, I have a, a question to kind of push in one direction or the other. He has, I mean, he has the, he has humanity in him, even though he, he, he does terrible thing. He has loved, he has loved in the past. Um, but is he, he's very biased towards um, certain people, certain ethnicities and. Okay. What were, what was the question? Um, when okay so he's thin skinned he demands loyalty he's proud he's smart um he's self absorbed so it sounds like he's kind of wounded easily oh yes okay um that kind of goes with the thin skinned when he's not being wounded is he like arrogant and demanding is he like everyone needs to listen to me but pouty because nobody does like how does is is he like does he walk in and just control a room or does he have to fight for power in a room how does that kind of work for him he, he commands attention and he think it he automatically does but as you'll learn he's um hooked on some drugs and does some drinking um because of the wounds. Uh, so maybe he senses that he's not commanding the room, you know, like he should have, should be. Okay. Um, so he has a sense of entitlement that doesn't yes. always come true. 
Yes. So he's kind of always clawing to be at the top. Yes. Okay. And I don't know if biased is the right word there okay. exactly. But he 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 um he casts blame. I'm trying to think. He's he doesn't forgive easily. He okay. he you know, he's uh so he has kind of that victim mentality. Everything's been yes. done to me. I get all the credit for all the things that go well, but everything that goes wrong is somebody else's fault. Yes. Okay. And maybe a little bit of my struggles harder than everybody else's struggle. I'm the only one who has things that are going wrong. Everybody well, else has it. I know way. everyone else is a fool. I know what needs to be done here. And um, he uses people. Great. So the reason that we wanted to spend a little bit of time in the personality of Carlos is because his voice wavers a little bit. Okay. We have him in the beginning, he's praying this prayer of gratitude just to himself. And then he's um, getting Omar to look at the, look at these crystals. And then he kind of is dismissive with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he questions Carlos again. Are you sure? But then he chastises him by saying, mind your tone. So it's like he's in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of like deferring to Omar, but then he's questioning him. But then he's chastising him. If you have somebody who thinks he's smarter than everybody else, who's super proud and is always clawing his way to the top, this mind your tone element might be the direction that you want to push these things. So when Carlos says to him, or sorry, when Omar, the geologist says to him, hurry, Carlos, they'll be here any minute. Somebody who's thin skinned and proud does not want to be told what to do. He's going to lash out here instead of mm, yeah. distracting, right? If you want him to be um, this kind of sense of entitlement, then um, it's kind of like, uh, these are all mine, right? Like, you know, <laughs> and then... Uh, Omar can be more like, well, I mean, they're ours, right? <laughs> like, so you can kind of play into that a little bit. Okay. Um, this idea of you verified these are Tibbs crystals, you're sure, is very like prompting somebody. Um, whereas somebody who it has like a victim mentality and thinks everyone else is a fool, maybe instead of you verified these are Tibbs crystals, you're sure. Um these better be Tibbs crystals. You better ah. be lying to me. Oh yeah. Right. So like you can take these elements that you already have and you can flip them around to figure out something that's much more, I'm, I am in charge here and less about like, I don't really know my place in this group. In his mind, He's the head of this band of merry little men here. He's using Omar. We right from the beginning want to see that this guy is a manipulative jerk who uses everybody around him. So maybe this first thing is when Omar says, hurry, Carlos, they'll be here any minute. Maybe Carlos says back to him something like, um, Omar, stop your worrying. I told you everything is under control, right? Like, I already have a plan to handle them. We don't need to keep this a secret anymore or like whatever it is. We just want to keep, we're, we just, we're keeping them here to keep them safe. I don't know. Oh, yeah. You're, you're the writer. I'm just like, but we want to show right from the very beginning that Carlos in no uncertain terms in his mind is in control of this. That's really excellent advice. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, left. nobody's ever gone through it, this level of detail. You know, I can write sentences, I can do this, but like this, this brings it, will bring it, I think, to the next level if I, if I do some of these things. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about dialogue is people have a tendency 
to talk the same way throughout a conversation. And by spending a little bit of time figuring out what their voice is like, we can take something that we've written that has a little bit of our voice in it and we can really line by line shift that to push the part of their personality forward that we want to show. Here, you want to show that Carlos is strong and manipulative and feels like a victim and is very thin skinned. So when Omar pushes back a little bit, he's going to tell him, mind your tone, right? Right. You wouldn't be here without me, right? Like this is kind of like your quintessential Carlos that you can use that as your touchstone. Not to say that Carlos's voice won't modulate later, especially as he gets angry. But by thinking about who is he and what you want him to talk about, somebody who is this entitled and thinks everyone else is a fool most of his sentences are probably going to start with I or you, right? You, if, it, if I'm telling you what to do, otherwise it's about me, right? Like I got us here. I have, you know, I have plans for us. You better not be lying to me. If I find out you're lying to me, we're going to have a problem here, right? Yeah. And again, here, Jeff, you idiot. These rocks are going to change the world. This one, mark my words, this is now a really interesting utterance. On one hand, I I love you've got this, like, I'm going to drill it in. But if he's really this entitled, of course, they're going to mark his words. He doesn't actually need to say it. So that's one of the things that you're going to have to figure out as you're figuring out his voice. Is he going to be more verbose where he uses more words than he needs to, to make his point? Because that's the insecurity he has up here. You said that um, he thinks everyone else is a fool. I don't know why this says user. It should say using. Well, he uses people. Yeah. Right. Um. Oh, that's why it said user. Ah, uh, because he's that kind of user. Oh, it's good. So, right, like if he's if he really needs it, maybe he does feel like because he's always trying to edge other people out, he does need these extra words. But if you're going to do it here, then anytime he's like trying to make a point, you're going to want to add it. So up here, mind your tone, Omar. You wouldn't be here without me. Um, before me, you were just in a dirty little shoebox of an office. I don't know, whatever Carlos said. <laughs> like, yeah. like you can add that one extra element when he gets mad and lashes out. And that can be something that you have for him as a go-to. Um, like, and then when we get here where he starts to say, like, stay in your lane, doc, this feels a little bit passive for him, right? Like, don't question me. I know what we're doing. Without me, you'd be nowhere. Um, I don't care about your so-called experts, your experts, your so-called experts are idiots or yeah. I know better, right? Like, so you've got the basics here, but just push it one step further to just really lean into that. Then we have a modulation. We have a slight frustration here. But then at the end of the chapter, and I'm trying not to show too much of the end of your chapter here because you have kind of a big surprise at the end, but I am going to scroll a little bit into the next section without showing the bottom part because you get Carlos in this section here where he is very angry. He's so angry that spittle is fl flying out of his mouth, right? And then he says, enough talk, shut up and eat. And everybody like shuts up. We assume everyone shuts up. You don't tell us. Yeah. We wanna, we're going to have to add that in there. But then he sits down and he becomes very, very calm. And right, like he's still talking about how his insubordination or their insubordination is enraging him but he's still very, very calm in his, in his actions. So 
if you're going to have that, you're going to need to tell us in, I'm assuming that by saying he popped several Adderall tablets and down some whiskey, this is controlling the lashing out for him. But this is one of those places, again, with the reader burden, you have him screaming at people, telling people to sit down and shut up. And then he sits down very calmly, deals with his anger internally, finishes eating, wipes his mouth. And then there's this huge reveal at the end. The emotions are not connecting for me with okay. his actions, especially based off of up here when you're saying that he demands loyalty with a thin skin. So if he's really this hurt, if his skin is this thin, perhaps the big reveal that you have at the end of the chapter needs to be more an act of rage rather than a calm, like I've thought through all of the details. So it's just something that as an author, you can go either way with it. You can make the choice that he, while he's thin skinned and he's proud because he's smart, he knows to control his emotions and doesn't ever let his emotions get the best of him. And then you can keep the story the way it is, but you have to explain that to us okay. in a little bit more detail. I had a word in there once and I, I'm trying to remember it and I'm not sure it would apply here. Is mercurial? He's mercurial where he he can flip flop. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but mm. it, it's a word that, me, you know, you, he can just flip flop like that. Um, mm. okay. I have to look it up again. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you have, if you are creating a character who is, a, and maybe the way that you can think about that is, or at least the way I can think about it, because I'm not familiar with that word is like more controlled. So like he's very externally, very controlled. In which case you want to back down the, uh, but wait, you're not saying that he's controlled. You're saying he can flip a switch. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking it up. Subject to sudden uh, or unpredictable changes of mood or mind. Mm. So I had that word in there once, but it sounds like it's not, I mean, I couldn't even remember. Yeah, yeah. so but, uh, that might not be. Okay, if you're going to lean on that, and that's totally okay, right? Because this is your, this is your story, you can create anything you want, you right. have to orient the reader to that, you okay. can't just because that's, that's, again, one of those reader burden things, right? Like, you know, in your head that he can flip a switch and make the decision that I don't have to deal with this anymore, because I have a plan in my head. So now I'm going to sit here calmly. You have to show us as the reader that that's happening. So Got maybe it. when you get to the place where he screams at everybody to sit down and shut up and eat, everyone is like surprised. You're showing like, the bottom. <laughs> oh, 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 so sorry. Sorry. Luckily, most of our listeners are listeners and don't see the bottom, but good catch. Thank you. I'm That's glad okay. you saw it. Okay. So maybe here after shut up and eat, you add um the people and what they do they're I don't know they're shocked they sit down yeah. they're scared whatever it is and then because you want Carlos to flip the switch after he takes the Adderall tablets and he downs some whiskey instead of hunching over his plate and forcefully fish stabbing each piece of fish maybe this changes to he gets control of himself mm. and you give some examples in the past, like, like he learned to do as a child or like he learned to do when his wife was dying, whatever it is. And then you have him apologize to the room or make a joke to the oh, room yeah. and then everybody calms down so that at the end, when your big surprise happens, it's actually a surprise and it, feels oh, more in line with who the character is so like he's compartmentalizing we all understand compartmentalization right you whatever it is you have to help the reader figure out how this is possible if you have this guy who's screaming at a room full of people 
gets super, super calm and then has this big action at the end, it's very disconcerting for us as a reader. We're like, he was angry. He's not angry. He does this thing. Like what, how, right? Just help us figure out those little details. Well, that's great. This would go for any chapter. This isn't just a first chapter thing. Exactly. Exactly. Some of the other things that we talked about also work for every chapter, but they're more important in the first chapters, orienting your readers to the scene, making sure that everybody is showing at the beginning of the scene. And we tell when they're, they, you you didn't do this, but sometimes um, it, like in a scene, somebody will be in the scene and then all of a sudden we're reading and we're like, where's that person? And the author's like, oh yeah, they left. And you're like, oh, <laughs> you didn't tell me they left. Right? As far as I'm concerned, they're still sitting there, right? Like, And that happens all the time because as writers, in your mind, you see the story. Sometimes the reader needs that a little extra help. And this is one of those places with Carlos. So does that help? It helps a lot. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off and we can talk for a few more minutes. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I say this all the time. I People are so probably tired of hearing this. I always say I'm going to turn off the recording and then I never know how to do it. <laughs>